Well, some of you thought we would never make it here. We're in the final chapter of the book of Ephesians. And one way or the other, we're going to finish it today, Lord willing. Uh, are you ready to be done with the book of Ephesians? Awesome book, huh? Yeah. Praise God. Let me get out our... Uh, it's already up. Thank you, guys. Equipping God's church. Even I'm ready for a new series, but boy, there's so much in the last chapter of this that I don't want to, uh, I don't want to miss a portion of it. It's just cram-packed. We could probably, we won't, we could probably spend a year preaching on the sixth chapter. Maybe that's just because I'm verbose, but <laughs> talk a lot. Uh, equipping of the church, God's equipping of the church. He has equipped us. We learned in multiple ways through the book of Ephesians how God has equipped us. And then there comes a time of response to the equipping. It isn't just that he gives us the equipment to do the things that we need to do. He then looks at us and says, well, will you do it? And there are practical areas to do it. And we started, was it two weeks ago, uh, going down through getting our lives in order, for instance, in the family. We talked about husbands and wives, and Sandy came up this morning and showed me a quote out of a book that uh, uh, she was reading from Dr. David Jeremiah, excellent preacher, if you get a chance to hear him. And uh, so uh, he was talking about the same thing. How do we live out the commands that God has given to us? Starts with husbands and wives. And again, that we, two weeks ago we did that. What good is our faith in Christianity if it doesn't work at home? Dead silence. That's not a condemning thought. That's an exciting thought. None of us are perfect in that area, starting with your pastor. How many of you know that? None of us are perfect. Some of you say, I don't want to raise my hand. You're not condemning me. We're agreeing together that we're still working on those areas. Uh, and we thank God for the changes. But how do I live a life that is worthy of God's calling? Starting with uh, uh, the home. We live a life of order. We live a life of order within our home, within our workplace, and within our world. How many of you know that Satan comes to bring disorder and chaos? Boy, you don't have any questions about that, do you? <laughs> you can sense the tensions and the chaos and the confusion when Satan is around. It's like, what are we doing? Where do we go? What do we say? How do we handle this? I don't know. And we're immediately taken back to James 1.5, which says, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to a few chosen people. Oh, no, no. All... Freely and liberally, Satan brings disorder and chaos into our life. And Christ brings order out of chaos. Amen? Amen. Sometimes by removing us from that situation, and sometimes by working through us and in us in that situation. That's his choice. By the way, it's also the choice of those around us. How many of you understand that? They get a choice too. I, some people like to live in disorder. I want everything order, orderly. I'm nuts that way. <laughs> right down to when we were serving communion this morning. And I was serving the bread and there's a little jagged piece of crust that's coming out there. And I just, this is me, this is my crazy nutsness. I just felt wonderful when Trina reached over and just smoothed out that edge of the crust by ripping off and, and you know, I, we like order in our lives. Don't we? How, come on, how many of you like me? You like things in order. Don't like a lot of surprises. A few surprises every now and then are, can be good, but mostly we like order and we like things to go that way. That's a godly trait, by the way, not paranoia, not uh, perfectionism, 
That's not godly. But the sense that things have a place that we're designed to be in that place and that we live happiest and we're most well adjusted when things are in that order that God put them in. Does that make sense? Who would know better than our creator what order our life needs to be in? And so Satan comes to bring disorder and chaos and Christ comes to defeat Satan within our lives and to bring order out of chaos. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God is not the author of confusion. If you find confusion in a situation, guess what? God didn't put it there. Now the next great revelation is he may be using you to restore order to that situation. Wow. Okay. God is not the author of confusion or chaos, but uh, he is the order, uh, the, excuse me, the author of peace. How many of you prefer peace to chaos? Oh, yeah. I don't know anybody who doesn't. Well, there are some folks who they, they thrive on chaos. I don't like being around those folks. I like peace, <laughs> especially the peace of Christ. Ephesians chapter 6, the last chapter, is about establishing order by developing godly relationships. Let me say that again. Ephesians 6 is about establishing God's order by developing godly relationships. And it's kind of a bleed over, as we said, from chapter 5, which is about husbands and wives and restoring order there. And we won't re-preach that sermon, but that's a good sermon. Uh, so godly relationships, starting with verse 1. Do you have your book of Ephesians out, chapter 6 and verse 1? I'm sorry, kids. <laughs> Very first thing God goes to, he starts with the husbands and the wives in five, and then he comes down to children. And I'll just tell you what a brat I was when I was a child. What do you mean some things have changed? No. <laughs> I remember at about 12 years of age, my, my mother was trying to get me to do something. I don't even remember what it was, whether it was a good thing. She didn't try and get me to do bad things, but just whether it was just minuscule or really important. But I was frustrated. And I knew a lot of the Bible, like you do at your age, uh, you know, the Olivers. And I just got, I'd had about all I could take it just seemed like she was, you know, I was probably more me than her. But I looked at her and I said, you know, the Bible says that parents aren't supposed to frustrate or anger their children. <laughs> Twelve. You know. Without missing a heartbeat, she turned around and said, do you know that the verses before that says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is the right thing to do? Shut my mouth. <laughs> we love. See, you can do that. And Sandy and I were talking about that before the service. You can do that with husbands and wives. Wives obey. That's not where it starts. It starts with both of you submitting to Christ and then submitting to each other equally. Wow. And then we get to children. And within the opening verses of here, it deals with the children. It says, children, obey. And then immediately it goes to fathers, and we'll get to that in a minute, but God never misses a trick. <laughs> he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And if you incorrectly interpret that, it means children, obey your parents if they're saved. That's not what it means. It means by the power of the Lord within you, children, obey your parents. By the power of Christ within you, Obey your parents. If you believe you're in the Lord, children, then you need to obey your parents. What is he doing? What is God doing? He's establishing order. How does he establish order? By establishing authority. Do you know that this world was designed by God to operate in a line of authority? Starting with Christ, and then the angels, and then human leadership. And we're at the place in humanity where we just defy every sense of authority. 
This world is out of order. It doesn't take you long to figure that out. This world is out of order. It doesn't like authority. It rebels against authority. And God says the only way to straighten up this world is to bring it back into the authority that I established. Christ first, your family next, husbands and wives, and then you care for your children, and the children learn to obey and love the parents. And as they learn to do that, even though parents aren't perfect, oops, did I say that? Even though parents aren't perfect, still God asks us, just as husbands and wives aren't perfect, and God says submit to each other, so he says, children, obey your parents. Well, what if they're wrong? See, the point is not are they wise, are they right, are they wrong. The point is God gave them the authority. If you want to restore God's presence in a place, then you have to restore authority. If they're wrong, God will make it right. What I mean by that is God will give them the wisdom to do the right things. Cheryl and I remember raising our kids. I made a lot of mistakes. Probably three times as many as Cheryl did. I don't know. She always seemed to have the right wisdom with the kids. Uh, but I, I made a lot of mistakes. But you know what? The authority of God was still there. Remember the message last week? Same message. You have a president. And you say to yourself, I didn't vote him in, for those of you who didn't, like me. And yet he has the authority. Why? Because God says, nobody has authority that I didn't give it to them. So therefore, God said last week, submit to them. Well, they're wrong in a whole bunch of places. That's God's problem. You do what you can do and Trust in God to work out the wrinkles for the rest. We're ordered to do that by God. That's how you restore order to a nation. Let God deal with it. I'm not at all suggesting this should happen. And trust me, I'm not suggesting this should happen. But I re remember 10, 15 years ago, the country of Romania. They had a dictator that was brutal. And when I say brutal, he'd just line people up for no reason and poof, mow them down. He was the worst possible kind of ruler. And the church began to pray. The Christian church began to pray. And as the Christian church began to pray, he got worse. Sometimes it'll do that. The truth will set you free, but first it may make you miserable. <laughs> and he began to get worse and worse. Finally, he stood on the steps of the Capitol building uh, of, uh, you know, w within Romania. His name was Ceausescu. I don't know how many of you remember him, President Ceausescu. And he stood there and he declared, I'm going to bring the church to its knees and I'm going to take it into extinction. The church of Christ will not exist in this country. A few months later, somebody mowed him down on the steps, and a year later, a church met on Sunday mornings in that building, in that very building. When things are out of order and the people in authority don't want to change, God will take care of it. Don't worry about it. He is well able to take care of it. God, if he knows the church is praying, if he knows you're believing, he'll take care of the details. I hate that saying, the devil's in the details. No, God is in the details. And we need to relax and let him have that. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is just plain right. Whatever you may think about, whether they're right or wrong or smart or not smart, it doesn't matter. Because God says, I gave them the authority. So you need to learn to obey them. Well, why? Because someday you're going to want to work a job. And you're going to go out to work a job. And I, let me tell you, my whole generation didn't do well there. My generation was the hippies of the 60s. And they didn't learn submission to authority. And they couldn't hold a job. Because when they went out, they didn't understand authority comes from God. And they didn't like what the boss did, so they told the boss off. And the boss fired them. And by the time they were 40, they were out of marriage, they were out of a job, and they were back home living with mom and dad. 
Why? They never understood authority. You restore order by restoring authority. Mm. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Are you getting the principle, whether it's the president or your parents or your husband or your wife or the father over the children, it's the same. Honor the authority, God says, I placed within them. Honor that authority. When you do, there will be peace. God can restore order. Can you imagine, wives, if you treat your husbands with love and honor? Wow, how they'll respond. Imagine, husbands, if you begin to understand the authority God placed in your wife. I had a miss, uh, how do I say that? A messed up theology is the best place. When Cheryl and I were first married, I thought, I got to bear the whole burden of this family somehow. Wrong. Missed the whole point in the scriptures where it said that she's my helpmate, which means a suitable helper, someone who's equal to the task. Missed that. Flat out missed it. And, and somehow had a thought that I needed to look down on her. I don't think I've ever said this to her before, but she experienced it. I didn't mean to. It's not what I thought I was doing. But in the meantime... It was like she was just, you know, there and I had to take care of her. I don't remember how long we were married when I first began to discover that God could speak to me through her, but it was a major revelation. I don't know, five, ten years. And I began to understand that God would use her to speak to me. Major revelation. Duh. I was a little slow little slow, and God began to speak to me. And as I listened to God speak through her, life got smoother. Things began, began to come more into order. Wow. We need to honor the image of authority that God has placed in our mates and in our parents. And here it says, honor your father and your mother which is the first commandment, he says, with what? A promise. What's the promise? This is right out of Deuteronomy. It's right out of the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments. This is heavy-duty theology here. The Ten Commandments. And within the Ten Commandments comes this, the first commandment with promise. If you honor your parents, it'll go well with you. What's the assumption, the reverse assumption? You don't honor your parents. Life will not go well with you. Wow. That's because you're not understanding the authority of God that is there. Number one, life will go well with you if you obey your parents. Number two, you will enjoy a long life. It's not just longevity of life. He says you will enjoy your life as you're going through it. You'll have a long life, but it'll be enjoyable. How many of you vote for an enjoyable life? Yeah. Kids, then, we need to honor our parents. Fathers. I, I love the way God does this in this short passage of chapter 5 and chapter 6. He just kind of, you know, stops here for just a minute, drops a bombshell, flips the coin over, goes to the other side, and says, now, for the other side. We've talked about how children need to do what they need to do, which is to obey. But fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath or to anger or to, I think it's the New Living Translation says, exasperation. If they don't understand where you're headed and why you're going there and what the family's all about and all they hear is that you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, then guess what? It will anger them. It will frustrate them. Mm. But instead of provoking them to anger by making impossible demands on them, instead of that, bring them up in the discipline and the instruction. King James Version says, in the nurture and admonition. Those are 50-cent KJV words. 
But I like these words a little bit better, easier to understand. Bring them up in discipline. Do you know that discipline is about 90% instruction? We think of discipline as spanking them or sending them to their room or putting them in, a, in, in a, what do they call that? Time out or, or whatever. Uh, just saw that on a Christmas movie Cheryl and I were watching yesterday together uh, on Hallmark. Uh, so bring them up in the discipline. Discipline is 90% instruction. And it is 10% correction, but sometimes we think discipline is 90% correction. Beaten on these poor kids. No, it's not. And then instruction. Instruction in what? The Word of God. Deuteronomy says when, you rise, when they rise up in the morning, when they lay down at night, you're giving them the Word of God. You're teaching them biblical principles. I look at several of our families. They're just doing it. They're just doing it. I think of Josh and Liz and the Olivers. I know they're instructing their kids in the Word. Doesn't mean that they'll always make the right choices, but it means the seed of the Word of God is within them. And it also means that when you plant the Word within them, sooner or later they will come back to the seeds that you've planted them. I'm claiming all kinds of promises from the Scriptures from every one of my kids. And what that means is they shall be taught of the Lord. That's a Scripture promise. They shall be taught of the Lord. They shall be corrected by the Lord. He said, and you may be saying, if you're a young parent, Josh, I don't know if you ever feel this way, you and Liz feel this way, but it's like, you know, how much is enough discipline? How much is too much discipline? Where's the line? What kind of discipline? What do I say? What are the words that I use? What gestures do I use? Parenting is tough stuff. It's not for the wimps. A lot of parents just in America just give up. They don't parent. They want to be the best bud. They want to be the pal. Kids don't need a pal and a best bud. Kids need the authority of God within their life to function in a loving, kind, instruction, instructive way. And holding children accountable when they don't follow that in a loving way. I notice it says instruction and discipline that comes from the Lord. That comes from the Lord. Wow. One of the lessons I've had the hardest time learning is not to discipline out of my anger. If I'm out of control, how can I bring my child into control? Hello? I've got to get myself under control first. And then prayerfully say, Lord, what do I do about this situation? How many of you know that takes time, energy, uh, prayer, Ephesians uh, 6. Okay, we're leaving family. We've been on husbands and wives. We've been on children. We've been on parents. Particularly, I find it interesting there that God didn't deal with mothers. I think mothers tend more to have the heart of God for their kids. I don't know why, but I see several husbands and fathers saying, yeah, yeah. They just tend to be more inclined to know what to do and how to handle it and have the gentleness of Christ, but the firmness uh, of authority. That, that. So God didn't find it necessary to say to moms, now moms, do this. I don't know why, but there's a good reason, I think. <laughs> moms are the tender ones, usually within the home. We leave the home, and now we go to labor relations. Oh. If there is a passage that America needs today, whoop, it's this one. We could solve the economic issues of America today. I sincerely believe that if we understood and lived out the biblical principles just in this short passage. Now, he says slaves because in those days they had them. But it's labor relations. It has to do with uh, employer, employees, slaves or employees. 
If you have people working for you, they are, they are your employees. They are not your slaves, but in those days they were. And this is what God said about employees. How should employees act? Obey, there's that word again. Obey. Children, obey your parents. Employees, obey the boss. <sighs> we live in a world today that says, if I don't like the boss and I don't like what he's doing, I'll form a union and I'll pressure him. Now let me tell you, unions, when they were founded, probably had a good purpose. Because management wasn't doing what it was supposed to do, and so there was an overreaction, kind of like the women's lib movement. Husbands weren't doing what they were supposed to do and having a biblical and godly attitude, so there was a sinful, fleshly overreaction to men not being what they were supposed to be. Instead of women dropping to their knees as Sarah did and praying, Lord, take care of my husband, as Cheryl did, <laughs> Lord, you see, take care of that. Then we've got unions. Unions make the demands. Why is America not able to produce what it used to produce? We've gone from one extreme to the other. We've gone from labor or from management having all the power to labor unions having all the power. This nonsense about labor unions uh, being in front of the Walmarts. I didn't see any labor, organized labor in front of our Walmart, but they had pictures of it all over. You know, they were going to disturb the sales for Walmart. They were going to force them to do... You know what God says about all that? And by the way, yes, I was at one point a union member. Cheryl and I worked for RCA Corporation when we were in college, and you couldn't, you couldn't get a job there if you didn't join the union. So we were members of the IBEW, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And uh, so for several years we were there, and I saw the nonsense of management. And I saw the nonsense of the labor unions protecting guys who should have been fired years ago. And the union protected them. Craziness. What we need is God's order restored. And so God says to the employees, obey your masters or your employers just as you would obey Jesus. Now, does that mean you have no rights and you're now a doormat? No, that's the point where you say, Lord, this is unfair, this is unreasonable. And Lord, I ask you to take care of it. But I will obey the master, and then I'll go to prayer. Does that make sense? You're not left without power to change the situation you're in. Can I repeat that? Prayer is the most powerful tool in your arsonary, your weaponry as a Christian. If things aren't as they ought to be, you have a couple of options. Leave and go someplace else. It always amazes me that, that people say, well, we're just going to organize. I, how many jobs do you think are out there? There's not a lot of jobs out there right now. You know, where are you going to go? Uh, obey as Jesus, as if they were Jesus. Not only to win their favor, but to do God's will from the heart. Huh. Got to add that from the heart, huh? It means don't try and look like you're doing it from the heart when you're not and your heart isn't in it. He goes on to say, not only to win their favor, but to do God's will from the heart. Look at the situation. Say, Lord, what do you want me to do? He's already answered it. I want you to obey your boss. Do what he says. Wow. But the boss isn't real wise in some areas. Talk to him kindly. Respect him. Pray over it. And then do what he says. God will bring a change. Sooner or later, God will bring a change. You and I spend hours talking about where you guys work and what's going on. Uh, God is well able to change the situation. Okay. Masters or employers. Now he flips the table. See? Children, parents, employees, employers, masters, employers. Treat your slaves or your employees the same way. The same way as what? Number one, the same way you want to be treated. Number two, 
Treat them in the same way that the scripture said above that the employees were to treat the employers. What is that? With love? With respect? Doing for them what you can? How many of you have ever watched the TV program Undercover Boss? Several. Isn't that a great program? Most of the episodes are really amazing. Cheryl and I watched one last night that was um, the head of Diamond International. I know he had something like 2,000 resorts around the world. And he went incognito into the, uh, you know, uh, to help out and, and to examine what's going on in his corporation. And they always walk away saying, I had no clue how hard my employees worked. I didn't know they worked that hard. I didn't know they didn't have safety issues covered. I didn't know this. I didn't know that. And they wind up doing what needs to be done for the corporation and even going beyond to do personal things. It's a great program. It's kind of a restoration to where we're talking about right now. That's why one of the reasons I like that program. Treat your slaves or employees as you want to be treated. Do not threaten them. And then he reminds those who are employers, yeah, he's saying, yeah, don't threaten. That's management versus labor. Labor threatens, you know, I'm going to walk, and management threatens with, fine, I'll cut your, cut your wages and cut your benefits and not meet your contract or whatever. God says, don't threaten them. Christ is your master, too. Everybody has a master. The boss has a master. Politicians, who do they work for? Well, no. According to God's authority, who do they work for? Us. Whether or not they do is another issue. That's where you go to prayer. Okay. Now, 10. 10 through 18. And I have just a little, it's not little. Here we go. This is about putting on the armor of God. Oop, back up here. Okay, verse 9. And we go to uh, verse 10. And let's read verse 10. I've walked you through it up to this point, but uh, I want to go into the passage. Verse 10 says, Finally, in the midst of rebuilding your relationships, in other words, in the midst of restoring order to your home, to your church, to your family. Finally, be strong in the Lord. He doesn't say develop a strong personality that you can confront people you don't like. He says be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. And then he says here's the secret because it's spiritual warfare out there. It's not just people against people. It's not husbands against wives and parents against children and management against labor. If you want to restore order, you need to understand there is a spiritual warfare going on. One third of heaven, the angels were kicked out and under Satan's leadership are a cadre causing chaos. They are disturbing everything and every relationship they can. It's the enemy's job to bring death and confusion. And he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. We're going to talk about this and what it means. Everything from the helmet of salvation to the breastplate of righteousness to the uh, belt of truth to the shield of faith to the sword of the spirit and having your feet shod with the gospel uh, preparation of the gospel of peace. And he says, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Hmm. For our struggle is not against people. You ever in a relationship where you're butting heads? And you're determined you're going to win and they're determined they're going to win. And what happens? Nobody wins. Let me tell you, in that situation, if somebody wins, somebody loses. And if somebody loses, 
they're not going to like it and they're going to retaliate. The best part of negotiation skills, I used to teach negotiation skills, and part of that is, is very simple. The only way to win is if both people win. You come to the table and both of you win. Both of you feel like you get something. Washington needs to learn that. I don't know whether we'll go over the cliff, but I can tell you it'll depend on this. Do, do they learn that both people have to win in a negotiation? Both sets of, of ideals have to give something in order for there to be a win. I'm speaking humanly in human relationships. God's in charge of all of it, and he'll take care of it in the end. But in the meantime, we do need to learn to live peaceably with one another. So put on the full armor of God so that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes because he's at war against the, you and I. For our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but against, and he goes through a list, rulers. He's talking about heavenly rulers. Against the authorities that have been kicked out of heaven. Fallen angels that have the ability to disrupt human life against the powers of this dark world. How many of you would agree this is becoming a darker and a darker and a darker world? Okay. Uh, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What's in the heavenly realms? Fallen angels. Okay. Fallen angels. And then he says, therefore, put on again... Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, and I think we're there, you may be able to stand your ground. And having done all or everything, to simply stand. Fight the battle, take your stand, and stand firm. Don't give up. Don't give up ground uh, in the spiritual battle. And so then he says in verse 14, stand firm with the belt of truth. Here's the belt of truth. What holds it all together? The belt. When I get dressed in the morning, I put on my shirt. Now it won't fall off, but it looks silly if I wear my shirt sleeves and my shirt tails on the outside. And then I put my pants on. If I don't put a belt up, guess what? They fall down. So I tuck my shirt in, and then I put the belt on, and it holds everything together. What holds us together spiritually? The truth of God. What is the truth of God? The Word. It just holds everything together. I love the phrase that Barbara's used for years. <laughs> when we speak of truth... Are we speaking about my truth or your truth? I see a situation this way. You see the situation that way. Oh, thank you, Marcia. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they're two different truths. Each of us see things from our perspective is what she's saying, and we're not always willing to give in the middle of that. Do you know what God says? Never mind your truth. Let's get to my truth. Because when we get to the truth of God, then you begin to solve the problems. Just like we talked about all the things labor and management should do, or politicians and the adherence to those politicians, how they should respond. Okay? So the belt of God's truth, the scriptures, holds it all together. That's why you need that. I'm just going to literally in about five seconds go through these. Uh, let's put them in the order that the scriptures put them in. Uh, he begins with put on the full armor of God. Stand then with the belt buckled around your waist or holding it together with the truth of God. And then with the breastplate of righteousness in place. The breastplate of righteousness. That's this armor here. Now in those days that armor kept out arrows and spears. It was metal and nothing could get through. The scriptures talk about fiery darts that the enemy throws at us. You feel them hit you and you go back a little bit. If you put on the breastplate of righteousness, 
you have protection. Can I just tell you, it has nothing to do with our righteousness. In fact, the Bible says that my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. There's nothing about my righteousness. We try so hard to be righteous. I want to be good. I want to be righteous. It's not about my righteousness. I don't have any righteousness. It's about the righteousness of God. He's talking about perspective that comes out of the word. What is the right thing to do? Well, based on whose philosophy? Based on God's philosophy of righteousness. What is the right thing to do? Mm. I'm going to move super quick through these. Breastplate of righteousness. Stand having your feet shod or fitted uh, with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. When we share the gospel, it's a gospel of peace. The world is a mess with chaos. And God comes with a gospel of peace. Peace be unto you. Part of the Christmas message. Peace be unto you. What is this world looking for? Peace. Peace. God says it comes through the gospel. You receive Christ and he begins to restore peace. Even though you're in the midst of a mess. Does that make sense? Even though you're in the midst of a mess, God can bring peace peace to it, his peace. In, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the shield of, of faith. That's a little shield. Some of the shields are great. That's more of a buckler than a shield. Uh, a shield is it cover you can put your whole person behind it and there's usually in a in a great warrior there was a person who ran in front of the warrior who took the shield and would plunk it down covering the warrior's whole body and he'd stand there and then the warrior behind him would shoot whatever he needed to shoot in terms of arrows or spears or whatever because with this buckler, and the scriptures talk about, the Lord is my shield and my buckler. He covers me in the little areas, and he covers me in the big areas. Uh, the shield of faith. So much in this, and I'm, I'm trying to cram it into one lesson. Uh, there again, we could take a year and go through it, but the shield of faith. You can't live the Christian life without faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you want to please God, put the shield of faith out there so that when the darts of the enemy come at you, you lose your job, your finances drop, your IRA loses value, uh, your children don't obey God. Whatever arrow comes at you, you deal with it in faith, in faith. Uh, believing that God's going to take care of that situation. And then he says, with which you can extinguish all the, fire, the flaming arrows. And then take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. How many of you know where most of our problems come from? Our mind. He says, when you go into battle against Satan, put the helmet of salvation on don't think like the rest of the world. Think like a born-again Christian. You have been saved. Think about what that salvation means to you and what God is going to do to you. That's a part of the battle. Take the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Spirit. This one, I, is, the notes that I passed out have a larger sword. I like the larger sword. Whereas this is just a little one. <laughs> uh, the sword of the Spirit which is literally the Word of God. How do we answer the world with the Word? How do we answer our kids with the Word? How do we answer our husbands, our wives, our bosses with the Word? And what I mean by that is sometimes literally quoting the Word, that's the most effective, and also responding based on what the Word says. 
the Word of God. And then he wraps that all up with pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Keep on praying always. We do that a lot here. You can never do too much prayer. And then here's the last one. Closing salutations, and we end with this. Pray for me, Paul says. Paul needs prayer. We all need prayer. Pray for me. He says, pray for me that I may speak forcefully the word of God. Then he says in closing, it's the bottom of the letter, end of Ephesians, Tychicus will tell you how I am doing. Paul had two secretaries, two male secretaries, who were with him at different times in his uh, preaching itinerary. One was Tychicus, the other one also began with T, uh, Teretus. Tychicus and Teretus. And they literally wrote down. And then he took one of the books at the end and he said, See, I want you to know I'm authenticating this book, that I'm writing it. See how large I write. Indications were that Paul was partially blind, really couldn't write much. So Tychicus and Teretus did the writing for him in the letters that he sent out, and then he signed it, and he said, look how big I sign it. Just so you know that it really is me, Paul. Wow. Tychicus will tell you how I'm doing. How I thank God for the folks around the church here who stay in with us and, and uh, hang in with the leadership. And Do you always agree? No. Sometimes I say, don't bother to disagree. I just changed my mind. You know, sometimes we need to change our mind. Uh, and then he says in closing, peace, love, faith, and grace. Peace, love, faith, and grace to all of you who love the Lord or who love Christ. What will establish order in our world? The peace of Christ. What will it do to surrender to the authority that God has put over us? It'll bring us peace. It'll help us to live in the love of Christ. It'll build up our faith as we see God begin to act instead of our hyper control. Any other control freaks here? I say other control freaks. Okay. Whew. Had a terrible dream the other night about I'd lost all control of bodily functions and I was in a nursing home and it was a horrible uh, thought, you know. And it was all about me trying to control. I understood the subliminal message was I was trying to control and God says, relax. I got it. Faith. And finally, grace, which is simply, I don't deserve the blessing of God. But by his grace, he will give it to me. He will lead me, guide me. When I'm wrong, he'll correct me and set me back on the right path. I can't lose. Do you understand? You can't lose. As long as you live under the authority of Christ, it doesn't matter what people think about you. It doesn't matter what the circumstance looks like. It doesn't matter. Because you win when you surrender to Christ. Amen? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for helping us to get through uh, Ephesians chapter 6, Lord. Thank you for all that we learned within it. Guide us as we go into the Christmas season and the Advent season. Fathers, we begin to look at the fact that Christmas is Christ's answer to our anxiety. Thank you, Lord, that you have a strong message of why you came to us to bring salvation and to place your peace within us. We thank you for all that we've learned. Help us to live it out and walk it out in simple practical ways. Help us to grow up into the truth that we've learned. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.